So, do you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So, uh, I would continue uh, my exposition. So, I'm back full screen. So, a uh, typical question is like modeling distribution, like here, a set of points uh, using a probabilistic uh, model, which is a, a, a measure or a distribution parameterized by some, some theta vector here. And you want to make the two distribution as close as possible. So you want to modify theta for the red distribution here to like shift and become as close as possible to beta. So the question of the talk is what should be the discrepancy capital D that you want to use to minimize in order for the two to be as close as possible. Okay. And uh, here, of course, I would advocate for optimal transports, which is an automatic method, if you want, or an optimization method that takes as an input uh, distance between pairs of points. On the left could be like the geodesic distance on the surface, could be distance between world in an embedding space, could be, for instance, for genomic applications, the distance between uh, two cells in the space of genes. And you take this distance a little d between pairs of points and turn it into a distance capital D between groups of points or more general probability distribution. This is a general question. So I would recap or uh, re um, explain for those who don't know what is the definition of optimal transport. And then I will speak about entropic regularization, which is the main topic of this talk today, which is a way to deal with high dimensional problems. So first of all, historically, it was introduced by Gaspard Monge for military application, where he was looking for a bijection or a permutation sigma between two groups of points in order to minimize the total sum of travel distances. This was for soldiers to move uh, piles of sand in order to protect themselves. So this is, of course, a combinatorial optimization problem, which looks intractable. Uh, and, 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 and also, the, I think, more importantly, uh, what do you do if you don't have the same number of points, which will occur in practice? Uh, you could even think about situation where the number of red points, for instance, could be infinity. So you would like to deal with a more relaxed formulation. So the modern formulation of optimal transport is the one that was introduced by Kantorovich uh, in the 40s during the war. Uh, it's more general. It can deal with arbitrary distribution for the sake of concreteness, I only consider two discrete probability measures where the points uh, location are xi and yj, and they are equipped with mass ai and bj. So this is just a weighted sum of Dirac. And for the sake of simplicity, I assume they are probability measure, although this could be relaxed and we did uh, uh, some contribution to, to generalize this. And uh, the genius of Kantorovich, uh, for which he got actually the Nobel Prize in economy, is to introduce uh, what Kantorovich called a transport plan in the economic meaning of planification of economy. For modern uh, probab um, probabilistic wording would rather be a coupling, which is a joint probability capital P. So a big array of number, if you want. And each time you put a non-zero element in this array of number, it means you're going to transfer some mass between AI and uh, BJ, basically. For instance, you see here on the first row, you have a single non-zero element, which means uh, the first Dirac mass here is going to be mapped to the first Dirac mass here, uh, as in Monge. But you see the second row, you have two non-zero elements, which means that the mass is going to be split into two parts. Uh, so this is very different from Monge. And if you don't have the same number of points, this is very important to be able to split uh, red or blue points that you can map to more than one point. So now what becomes the conservation of mass equation? The conservation of mass equation is simply that if you sum the value of P on the rows, you should get back A, <coughs> sorry. And if you sum on the column, you should get back B. This is just like all the mass is going to be transferred. In terms of matrix notation, it means that capital P times the vector one is going to be equal to A, and P transpose times the vector one is equal to B. Now, what does it mean to be uh, optimal, according to Kantorovich? He made a huge simplification, like a modeling hypothesis that is very simplistic, but that simplifies everything. He made the hypothesis that transport is a linear function, transport cost, which means that if you double the amount of mass you would transfer, then you should pay double the price. I think this is totally irrealistic for economic application, but it simplifies a lot the analysis, simplifies the algorithm, and also uh, allows you to make a lot of very nice uh, theory. Uh, so now, uh, what do you minimize? You simply minimize the total sum of transfer distance. Um, so for, for Monge, it, it took the, the cost to be equal to the distance, but more generally, you can take the distance to some power P, and then you just sum all the contribution, and then you get a linear programming. So this is more or less like the, the birth of, of, of modern optimization, of, of modern linear programming, 
which was at the same time uh, studied by George Danzig, who introduced the simplex algorithm. So the simplex algorithm can solve any linear program, but there exist instances of simplex algorithm for which on this type of problem, they roughly have up to logarithmic term cubic complexity. So you see, we move from uh, exponential number of possibility in most problem to, I would say, a more reasonable cubic complexity in the size of the problem to, to solve exactly optimal transport. Okay. What can you do with it? Well, you get access to the optimal coupling, the transport, which is very nice. It allows you to transport mass, so it's nice to do planification. But what is more important from a mathematical perspective is that if you raise the value of this problem to the power one over p, it's defining a distance which is often called uh, the Wasserstein p distance. So in particular, it's zero if and only if the two measures are equal, alpha equal beta, and also it satisfies the triangular inequality, which is nice. Uh, but maybe you could argue that you know other distances that are much more simpler to compute. So why should you choose this distance over other competing distance like L1, L2, or whatever? Uh, I think the idea is to uh, understand what is the topology induced by this Wasserstein distance. And it turned out that the topology, at least if you are on a compact domain, is exactly what probabilists will call the convergence in law, or what uh, people in, uh, in uh, functional analysis will call weak star convergence, which is a weak notion of convergence when you say that two point clouds will converge one to the other if and only if all the possible expectations, all possible integrals against continuous function converges. So it's a soft notion of convergence, which basically means that the points should converge one to each other, like this. But there is a subtlety because it's convergence of measure. So at convergence, you could have two points, like the two red points here, that is going to be merged into a single point which is typically the behavior you want. For instance, you can use this topology to study convergence in law for central limit theorems. The central limit theorem is a theorem that states that a discrete measure, for instance, if you do a random draw of dices, is going to be converging to a Gaussian, to a continuous measure. So you see it's a very natural way to study a geometric notion of convergence. And this theorem, which is fundamental, tells you that convergence in law is metrizable by the Wasserstein distance. So it's really why, uh, I, mean, I think it's a key motivation. It's like a geometric notion of proximity that you want to use in practice. Maybe a, a way to contrast this is with uh, the L1 distance, which is often called the total variation distance. What is the L1 distance between two Dirac masses? If the two Dirac like this one and the limit are not exactly at the same position, the L1 norm between the two is always going to be equal to two because it's plus one here minus one here, the difference, and the sum of the absolute value is equal to two. So according to total variation, which is somehow called the strong topology, a Dirac that would be moving toward another Dirac is never converging. Whether for the Wasserstein distance here, since you raise to the power of p and then to the power one over p, you get exact equality between the Wasserstein distance between Dirac masses and the distance itself. So the Wasserstein distance, and you can show it's more or less the only distance that has this light properties under, under some uh, some, some simple hypothesis. So really the Wasserstein distance is embedding the ground distance little d into a powerful distance, which is geometric, that when you evaluate it on Dirac masses, you recover the initial one. So I think it's really a, a key motivation here is this lifting mechanism. Now you can say uh, it's cool, but it's very slow to compute. In high dimension, if you have a lot of points, n cube is, is just too, too much. And I would say more, I think in many applications, you are not really interested in exactly computing the optimal transport distance. You are perfectly fine with some smoothing or some approximation. And I will also try to argue that in high dimension, adding this regularization is really important. And a nice way to do it, which was introduced actually before Kotorovich, is uh, what is called the Schrodinger problem, which was introduced by Erwin Schrodinger in what he calls the lazy gas experiment, which is not a physical experiment. It's a, a sort of a, an experiment of salt where he, he was asking the question, you, you have two sets of molecules of gas, the same molecules of gas, at time zero and time one, and you want to infer the most likely trajectory between the molecules of gas. But there is a trick, the molecules of gas, they evolve according to Brownian motion. So the most likely connection between xi and yj to set, to, to, to set of points is not going to be a bijection, it's going to be, um, if you want, a coupling, it's going to be a non-deterministic uh, bijection. And then in his paper, in his very famous paper, Schrodinger did the computation and he found that the most likely connection between the xi and the yj is solving an optimal transport problem plus epsilon times Shannon's neg entropy, so minus the Shannon-Boltzmann entropy. 
PIJ, log of PIJ. And the Lagrange multiplier epsilon here is just the temperature of the gas. So you see, as you take the temperature to zero, which was called by Schrodinger the lazy gas uh, model, you recover optimal transport, uh, in fact, before Kantorovich. So it's, it's, it's fairly nice. And another way to view this epsilon uh, penalty is an entropic barrier function. You're penalizing positivity by adding minus uh, Shannon entropy, which as a bonus makes the problem strictly convex, so it has a, a unique solution on contrary to optimal transport. And I think the best way to view this is to do a drawing. If you take uh, two sets of molecules of gas with the same number of blue and red points, then there is a famous theorem by Birkhoff and Fondemann that tells you that the solution of Kantorovich is equal to a permutation which is a solution of Monge. So in this case, you get a one-to-one -one mapping. And as epsilon increases, you can show that as soon as, P, as epsilon is strictly positive, all the PIJ are non-zero. It's a property of, uh, of maximum entropy methods, basically. And to make the display meaningful, I only display PIJ, which are st stronger than 10 to the minus three. And you see that the effect is basically having more and more connection. And in fact, as epsilon goes to plus infinity, uh, in fact, every, you can show easily that everybody is connected with everybody with a very strong connection uh, uh, effect. So the, uh, the impact is twofold. There is two benefits of this. The first one is the algorithm which will be very fast as epsilon increases. I will explain this after. Uh, the second point is you will get a lot of stability. It's easy to show that as epsilon increases and as soon as strictly positive, in fact, the dependency between the inputs, so A, B, and D, and the output, which is capital P, becomes infinitely smooth. And you would see that in high dimension, it is very important to be able to discretize this problem efficiently. And I would, this would be the second take home message of the talk. Uh, the first take home message is the algorithm, which maybe some of you already know, which is called Sinkhorn algorithm, which I believe is one of the most beautiful algorithm ever, uh, because it's very natural, very simple, and quite efficient in, in, uh, on modern architecture. The idea is, is, is so nice, so simple, that I want to explain this into more details. Uh, the first step is here, you have a convex optimization under constraint. So you simply introduce Lagrange multiplier for the two constraints. And if you do the mathematics of the Lagrange duality, you would see that you are a solution if and only if you satisfy the constraints. And you are able to write down capital P in a diagonal manner as uh, the multiplication on the left by a diagonal matrix of U. So you will multiply the role by UI. And on the right, by a diagonal matrix of V, you will multiply the column by VJ. And what you need to scale to multiply this way is the so-called Gibbs kernel, which is simply exponential of minus the cost divided by epsilon. So if you think about the code being Euclidean and P between equal to two, this is a gigantic Gaussian matrix. Okay. So if you take a special case, which is the case where A and B are uniform distribution, so they are equal to one, then this is a fundamental question. This is actually older than optimal transport, older than Schrodinger is the question of, can you always scale a strictly positive matrix capital K so that it becomes bistochastic? This is a fundamental normalization question, if you want. So it's, it's even older, I would say, than, uh, than Schrodinger. And the simple equivalence tells you that it's always possible. And then there's a unique solution, capital P, because the problem is strictly convex. But of course, the question, the more important question is, can you compute this? And there is a heuristic way to derive the algorithm which is simply to plug back this factorization here, which says that P is equal to this multiplication here of, of, of matrices, where the unknown are U and V, and you multiply this by the vector of one to sum along the rows. And then you discover a very simple equation, which is this one, which is the fact that U multiplied by K times V should be equal to A. And this uh, multiplication sign here is uh, the Adamar product. So it's just a classical entry-wise multiplication of vector. Whether here, uh, k times v is really the multiplication of the matrix capital K by a vector v. Okay? And of course, you get the same equation, but you simply reverse the rule of u and v. So you see that solving Schrodinger problem is as simple or as difficult, depending on how you, you see this, as solving two systems of polynomial equation of degree two in u and v, because these are just like bilinear equations. But the trick is they are very high dimensional equations, so it's not so easy to do. The heuristic algorithm is just to use a fixed point method. You give me a V vector, then it's very easy to find the optimal U by simply doing this division. Here, this division is going to compute the U that solves the equation. But of course, when you do this, uh, it's not going to solve the second equation. So you iterate on the second equation the same way, and then you iterate the two equations, the two fixed points together. 
And of course, if it converges, it converges to the unique solution capital P. Okay, so if it converges, satisfies the fixed point, and since it's an equivalence, you have solved Schrodinger problem. So the natural question was the question of convergence of this algorithm, which was resolved in 64 by Sinkhorn. So Sinkhorn is not the one that invented the algorithm, but is the mathematician that proved convergence. And the proof is beautiful. It's exactly the same proof as the one, uh, if you want, of uh, the convergence of Markov chain. So the contractance of Markov chain, according to Birkhoff, so it's often called peron frobenius theorem, is exactly the same proof as Sinkhorn. So the proof is simple. But of course, uh, once you know the solution, it looks easy, but you, you, you have to come up with this beautiful idea, and it was uh, produced by, by Sinkhorn in 64. What's more to this uh, is, first of all, uh, it converges. But if epsilon is large, uh, which means you regularize a lot, then it converges very fast. It's because uh, Birkhoff contraction would be stronger, and you would converge linearly at a very good rate. But the downside is, if epsilon is small, it could converge super slowly. So this is not an algorithm that you want to use if epsilon is small. But I would argue that in machine learning in high dimension, you definitely want to use a high epsilon. So I would explain this after. Uh, in terms of convergence, it's a classical, I mean, you could rephrase this as a classical alternating minimization problem. So you can reuse classical theory of alternate minimization and show that if you want to reach precision uh, delta on the optimal or epsilon um, delta on the optimal transport cost, you can show that the precision epsilon, the temperature, should be equal to delta up to logarithmic faster. And the complexity, since it's only matrix vector multiplication to reach precision delta, is going to be n squared divided by epsilon squared, where epsilon is, is equal to delta. So you could roughly say that, that the complexity of Sinkhorn is, is quadratic uh, in terms of n, uh, which is a bit better than cubic. Uh, but what's more to this is that, in practice, it's just matrix vector multiplication. So it's really an algorithm that you want to implement on GPU. So I think the game changer, which was uh, noticed by Marco Cuturi, uh, a few years ago, is that this is an algorithm that is extremely efficient on GPU and that you can parallelize very easily. Okay? And then there have been some papers more recently that study linear complexity, so where you typically replace or approximate the matrix vector multiplication uh, in linear time. And in some cases, you can actually have an algorithm that is actually linear in N, up, of course, to some loss of precision. Uh, but people like this algorithm because it's an algorithm that is easy to implement very easy in a few lines of code. And that is also very easy to, to uh, optimize on GPU. This was, I, I think, the main, the main message from, a, I would say, an optimization perspective is that this is really a, a, very, nice, a very nice method. Then from a statistical perspective, uh, what can you do with this? A typical scenario, at least uh, a modeling scenario, is that uh, the, the, the points you are observing are, are realization from, or discretization from a continuous density. Could be a Gaussian, could be more complex densities. And the quick question is how many blue points do you need to be able to discretize efficiently your problem? So, for instance, you could look for how many points do you need for the Wasserstein distance between the, the, the point cloud here on the left, which precision delta on average over the true distance you want to compute. And the bad news is that in Euclidean space, uh, this is very bad. This was a theorem in 68 proved by Richard Dudley that the number of samples grow exponentially with the dimension. More precisely, it's going to be one over the precision to the power of the dimension. So if you think, even if the dimension is like 10, this is not practical. So if nobody tells you anything about your distribution, even if they are sampled from a Gaussian distribution, if you don't know they come from a Gaussian distribution, you can never basically compute optimal transport distance in high dimension. Okay, so this is, I mean, if you want to do better, you need to introduce some prior knowledge because this is also optimal. There's no algorithm that can beat the curse of dimensionality. It has been proved later. Uh, on contrary, you can study what happened with Schrodinger problem. And this is a theorem that was proved by Ojenve, which was uh, uh, my, PhD studies, my PhD student uh, a few years ago with Marco, that proves that uh, for Schrodinger cost, if you want to reach precision delta, all you need is the number of samples that is of the order 1 over delta to the square. So it's more or less the same complexity as Monte Carlo method. Everybody tells you that Monte Carlo breaks the curse of, con of dimensionality because uh, the number of samples need to compute integrals in a high dimension is one over the precision to the square. And it's exactly the same type of, of, of method. Of course, optimal transport is more complicated than computing an integral, so the proof is more involved, but it's the same line of ideas as Monte Carlo method breaks the curse. Uh, but there is a catch, of course, because uh, everybody that has tried Monte Carlo, they know that it's, in practice, not so efficient, and you need to reduce the variance, and it doesn't work so well in high dimension. And the reason is because the constant involved typically depends on the dimension. 
It's like a no-free no lunch theorem here is that, of course, if you look at the constant, it's going to depend badly in the dimension. Because we know that if epsilon goes to zero, you recover this theorem. So you know that it's not possible to, 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 to beat Dudley's theorems. So the bad news is that the, the constant is typically of the order one over epsilon to the power of the dimension. So if you really care about computing optimal transport, this will not help you because epsilon will depend on n, and typically one over n or something like this, and you would reach exactly the same uh, bottleneck as here. So the, the take-home message is not that uh, Schrodinger or Sinkhorn is curing the curse of dimensionality of optimal transport. It's rather telling you that this quantity is a new quantity that deserves maybe further attention. It has not been as studied as optimal transport. We have some theory behind it, but not so many actually. But if you believe this theory or this uh, quantity, sorry, is good for you, it's a good quantity that you want to use in practice, then this theorem tells you that if epsilon is not too small, this is something that you can do in high dimension. Okay. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a good or bad news because it tells you, I mean, well, it's a new quantity, you need to study it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's I think, a driving force for, for, for new theory of optimal transport uh, that we are I mean, still trying to investigate. What are the properties of this quantity? Does it work well on practical aspects of, of computation? Um, there are many extensions of this. I would not explain them in details. Uh, basically, you can apply this uh, uh, Sincorn algorithm to many more problems. This is just, I mean, one example that I like a lot. It was introduced by Guillaume and Marshall Aguay, Guillaume Carlier and Marshall Aguay a few years ago, which is the computation of Wasserstein Barry Center. Uh, maybe you know Mar Marshall Aguay died uh, five, five years ago now uh, from cancer, but he was really uh, one of the key leaders in optimal transport with, with Guillaume, of course. And they introduced this idea of, of doing Barry Center by minimizing the weighted sum of Wasserstein distance. So if you were in, in just one Dirac masses and you take p equal two, then this is just the classical definition of Barry center as minimizing the sum of L2 norm to the power two. And this is a natural extension where you replace the L2 norm by the Wasserstein distance. And the good news, it's not trivial, but you can see this from uh, some duality argument, that this is actually a convex optimization problem. Okay? On contrary to many Frechet mean type of method, this is convex, it's beautiful, and you can do a lot of theory, which is, has been done by Guillaume, and what you can do also on top of this is you can use Syncorn to compute the Barry center by once again introduce entropy. So I will not explain the algorithm, but the algorithm is very simple, very similar to the previous one, except, except the, the trick is instead of having just one optimal transport to compute, here you get like three optimal transport to compute in parallel. So you basically are running three Syncorn algorithm that you synchronize from time to time. It's like a synchronization uh, steps. But besides this, you're just like running Syncorn algorithm and you can do this even like to compute like very various things. For instance, we did a, a C-graph papers with Justin Solomon, where we compute Barry center of shapes that you view as probability distribution over voxels, so 3D probability distributions, and you compute the Barry center and this gives you interpolating shapes. So it's like probably not a very clever way to compute Barry center of shapes, but I think it's definitely the simplest possible way. I mean, it's really, really simple. It's like solving a convex optimization problem. And then you see on your screen some, some nice interpolation. Uh, of course, in practice, you don't want to use this to just interpolate between the donuts and, 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 and a duck, but you can do this in the high dimension for machine learning application to do clusterings and stuff like this. <coughs> uh, now I got like uh, 15 minutes or maybe, maybe so. Uh, I would like to, to explain some uh, possible applications to, uh, to machine learning, to generative models, uh, which is an imaginary application. And here, there's no mathematics. It's purely like experimentation, purely uh, numeric. So, so unfortunately, I mean, currently, I'm not aware of any like really like serious mathematics that have been done on this type of, of question. So the question is very natural. I mean, could say it's like the oldest problem or in statistics is the problem of, of parametric model fittings, or maybe you could call this like parameter estimation. You observe some distribution of points and you want to infer some models alpha that depend on theta. Probably the simplest approaches or the canonical approaches would be to what is called the maximum likelihood estimator is to uh, postulate a key hypothesis that all your measure alpha, they have a density rho with respect to a reference measure. For instance, if it's a Gaussian model, then you can think of dx as being Lebesgue measure, but you could think about any dx, the dx is not entering the picture, but it needs to be fixed. Then rho is often called the likelihood. The probability, if you see, if you think about it, as observing some x uh, values. So you want this row to be as high as possible. 
the key hypothesis in maximum likelihood is that the point would be drawn independently. So the likelihood of the set of points is just the product of the likelihood of the xi. Then it's customary to take minus the log, so you would minimize minus the sum of the log of rho evaluated at your point xi. And I think a good way to remember, I mean, to have some insight about what maximum likelihood is doing is to look at what happens when n goes to plus infinity. If the beta here becomes more and more dense, what it would be approaching is basically the relative entropy between beta and alpha. You can show that the limit as n goes to infinity, then this sum becomes an integral, and this becomes just the classical relative entropy, often called uh, the Kullback label of divergence. So what you do when you do maximum likelihood estimator is you minimize the Kullback, but and this is a, a key thing with respect to the first, uh, the second argument here. The reference measure is alpha, and what you observe is beta. This is nice and always, I mean, it often leads to optimal estimator in a various sense of statistics, in particular from Gaussian, you recover the classical estimation of mean invariances. <coughs> but the difficulty for many scenarios in high dimension machine learning is that uh, it is irrealistic to assume that all the model theta, alpha theta, they have a density with respect to a fixed measure. This is not really uh, feasible in high dimension. In high dimension, the typical model you would have rho would be singular, which equivalently, you can see this as you have log of zeros almost everywhere, so the maximum likelihood is not defined. So, uh, and an example, I mean, the canonical example, the one that people are, are trying to, to do nowadays, is called generative model fittings, uh, in which case uh, you forget about trying to find an equation for rho, because it could not exist, you rather describe a sampling mechanism. You describe alpha, not through an equation, but through an algorithm. You say that to generate a point from alpha here on the right, what you do is you sample a point in low dimension according to a Gaussian distribution or according to a uniform distribution. It's called the latent space model here. And you send the mass of the point using some uh, function g parameterized on your parameter, by your parameter. And of course, the typical scenario is when g is a deep network that would send point from low dimension to high dimension. Okay. A mathematical equation for this is to say that alpha is the push forward of the image measure of the reference measure zeta by your deep networks. And you see the problem is if the latent space is low dimension, then the high dimensional uh, measure is going to be supported on an hypersurfaces. So in particular, it's never going to have a, a reference measure that is fixed. It doesn't have a density with respect to Lebesgue, but if you move zeta, what it would do, it, it would like warp the space and it would move the surface and, and it's not possible to have a, a reference measure so that the maximum likelihood is undefined. So what do you need to do? You need to regularize your maximum likelihood. This is very well understood in statistics. And you need to come up with some regularizer, but it's hard, it's difficult. So maybe an, another way to view this problem is that maybe Kullback is not the good measure of distance. Maybe you should find some other distance. And one, one thing you can do is, of course, use uh, optimal transport. But as I've told you before, optimal transport doesn't work in high dimension. So what people are considering is to use optimal transport with regularization, for instance, uh, using synchron. So synchron algorithm, you can use this as a heuristics to replace a Kullback labeler di di divergences by something that is much more softer, that have a, a, a much nice regularity uh, with respect to the weak convergence, but at the same time is tractable in high dimension. Okay. But to be clear, there is absolutely uh, no theory in particular, this optimization is very, very non-convex, so it's very hard to come up with any theorems. Uh, this is just like standard architecture. I mean, I will not do a course on, opti on, on, on deep learning, but, but just to say that the deep network that you need to use in this case are not the same that you would use for classification purposes. This is not a classification purpose. It's an unsupervised generative problem. For classification purpose, usually your input in the network is like an image, for instance, and then the network is reducing the dimension until you reach a latent space of low dimension, and then you take your decision. So the goal of discriminative network is to reduce the dimension. Okay. For generative network, it's exactly the opposite. You want to start from a low dimensional latent vectors, and you want to progressively increase the dimension, uh, which people would often call deconvolutional networks, because usually these are convolution and, and, and subsampling. So convolutional networks, they reduce the dimension by convolution, uh, generative networks, they increase the resolution, they increase uh, the dimension by convolution. But besides this, is exactly if you want the mirror of a discriminative network. If you play backward in some sense a discriminative network, then you have a generative network. It's kind of funny, it's, 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 it's surprisingly simple, but also it was invented fairly recently. 
And you can see the problem is you get uh, you, you, you do random samples, then you compute fake images. So often people refer to this as uh, deep fake images because it's fake images created by deep network. Then you get the distribution of images and you want to, them to be as close as possible from the input distribution. And this is unsupervised in the sense that you don't say X1 should be equal to Y1. You want the, the full set of images you generate to be uh, as close as possible to the full set of input images that you have in your data set. So it's extremely difficult, much more complicated than training a classical network for uh, supervised learning. How do you do this in practice? In practice, it's, it's too complicated because uh, the number of points in, you, in, your, in your data set is huge of the order of millions. And, and basically the red points, you have an infinite number of fake you can generate. So what you would do is you, of course, you would do this with your stochastic gradient descent. At each iteration, you compute a fresh batch of samples from beta, a fresh batch of samples from alpha, and you do a gradient step. One key difficulty, unfortunately, is that it's in this case, you cannot use classical theory of stochastic gradient descent because uh, you don't have an unbiased estimate of your gradient because the empirical Wasserstein distance when you compute this gradient is not going to be unbiased. You're going to have a bias. And this is non-trivial. And to the best of my knowledge, this has not been completely uh, mathematically studied, the convergence of this algorithm towards the minimizer or towards something that you could say some theory. How do you do in practice? In practice, it's not a big deal. I mean, it's not a big deal. I mean, of course, theory is important, but in practice, numerically, uh, you would use backpropagation, you would use uh, automatic differentiation. So I think deep learning, and in particular, generative model, is really nice because it's the first time, I mean, you, you can witness such uh, an explosion in the use of automatic differentiation. I, I would say automatic differentiation was mostly a niche market before. It was used in companies and so on. But I don't think it was used so many uh, in so many fields. And now through the emergence of, of, of PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX, and so on, this has been totally uh, democratized. So I think the revolution of deep learning is also the revolution of the democratization of uh, automatic differentiation. So here's just an example of the computational uh, diagram, computational flow. And you see it already starts to look quite complicated because uh, first you get the generative networks here that you use. Then you compute the distance matrix. <coughs> then you compute the Gibbs kernel. And then you run SyncCon, which you might think of as being some kind of a, of if you want recursive network. And then you need to uh, backpropagate or to differentiate backward this function with respect to the input, uh, which unless you are really skilled is very uh, painful to do. Uh, so if you are not skilled enough, uh, I think you should definitely consider using uh, JAX or PyTorch, which, which makes this make your life easier. There are also a lot of tricks you can use instead of backpropagating through SyncCon, you can use uh, implicit differentiation, which is really cool. So you get a lot of, of, of bonuses you can do, uh, but in general, this is really something that is easy to do on GPU to compute the gradients. So okay, the take-home message, there's no theory, but in practice, it seems to work quite nicely. It works nicely if you test on simple images. Like if you take uh, binary digits and you train your SyncCon uh, generative model, it works like a charm. But this is because the images are very simple. What happens in practice is if you train this on complicated images, it doesn't give you good results. The image looks blurry, <coughs> and this is not state of the art. If you want to reach state of the art, and this is another layer of difficulty, you have to use what are called generative adversarial networks or GANs, which was introduced a few years ago by Jan Goodfellow and collaborators. And if you think uh, it was not explained by, like this by Jan Goodfellow, it was more like a heuristic uh, description, but a way to describe this uh, using optimal transport is that uh, the vanilla method doesn't work because uh, Comparing uh, images using Euclidean distance for the, for the optimal transport cost is definitely not good. Everybody knows that the images, you cannot really like trust Euclidean distance. They, they are not a good way to measure the discrepancy between the images. So what Goodfellow proposed is to actually train the cost. Train the cost using once again uh, uh, a neural network. So instead of comparing directly X and Y, you train another network H that you would use to do the comparison. Okay, now you need to select uh, some principle to, to, to select what should be H, some guiding principle. And the key insight of GANs is you should train H in order to be as discriminative as possible. So according to Goodfellow world, H is acting like a discriminator or a cop, if you want. He wants to be able to discriminate between the good images, beta, 
and the fake image is alpha. So now what you need to do is to train a min-max problem. You want to train your generator in order to minimize uh, the resistance and distance. And you want to train your discriminator in order rather to do the opposite, to maximize the, 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 the travel distances. So really now you are doing a game theory method. You, you are trying to solve a saddle point for a min-max problem, which is highly, it's not at all a convex concave saddle point. It's not even clear. It's existing. I mean, there's many open problems. In practice, people use heuristics. They do like gradient descent ascent or, or method like this. Uh, but it's purely heuristical and there's absolutely no theory that I'm aware of that can guarantee, even in simple case, uh, that you can uh, actually compute an efficient or a good uh, pairs of networks this way. But this is like super exciting. Uh, this is an example. In fact, if you Google online uh, generative adversarial networks and you can go to YouTube, you would see hours of video. Uh, be careful, the videos doesn't correspond to, to, to optimal comfort at all. They are rather like simple interpolation just to uh, give you some insight about what the network is doing. So what you do is you select two points uh, on the Latin space, and then you look at the image of this on the space of images, and this gives you this kind of animation, if you want, of the faces, which are like really, really amazing. And it gives you like, in some cases, like really like photorealistic interpolation. <coughs> Uh, but be careful, it doesn't really mean that the network is like minimizing efficiency the vast such time distance. Because here you're just looking at nice picture, but, but it doesn't tell you that the two distributions are actually close together. Uh, for instance, you don't know, for instance, if you in your data set, you have as many uh, women as men, uh, you want the generation to, to produce this exact same ratio. So, so really the question of minimizing the vast such time distance is deeply connected to minimizing sampling bias. And this is very hard to assess in high dimension. And nobody really knows if this is true or not. This raises a lot of, of open questions on how to assess actually the quality of the generation. So as a conclusion, uh, I think it's very exciting. So we are like standing on the shoulder of a lot of very clever mathematicians that built, I mean, lots of, of, of formulation and mathematical analysis. But I think what was lacking in the, in the mathematical community is understanding the, the impact of dimension for like Brogniers, Villani, or Figalis. The dimension is just a constant. And, and even if you read the book of Villani, you, you never see really how the dimension impacts really the, the, the method, the theorem, and so on. I think what's new in machine learning is, is we want to study the impact of dimension. And this really brings new questions. Can you really do this with samples and so on? So it's really creating new mathematical questions and algorithmic questions. One such question that is very stimulating for genomics application is, can you do optimal transport not between the same space, but between two different spaces? And there was some proposal for this. One of such is called gromov wasserstein which was introduced by uh, Facundo Memoli a few years ago. And, and now the question, I mean, the, the formulation, which I'm not going to explain, is becoming non-convex. So instead of a linear program, you get a quadratic program. And it raises a lot of new questions about like how can you so this with algorithm, and this is a recent work of my student Otman that did numerics to study optimal transport between two sets of cells, but that has been computed using two different uh, types of, of, of modalities. This is uh, basically uh, expression of the genes, and this is basically uh, counting the proteins in the cells. So it's like two space of two different dimensions, and you'd like to fuse uh, the cells together in order to have a, a better representation. This is very interesting, and, and there's currently, uh, I think, no theory about this. Uh, with this, I would stop my presentation, and if you have questions, I'd be very happy to answer. Thank you, Gabriel, for this nice introduction. Uh, it made uh, a few things clearer, at least, at least for me. Uh, I'll take the, I replace Emiliano, who will have to, to leave in a few minutes. So if you have any question, you can raise your hand, you can put them in the chat. Yeah, I'm not putting the chat. Are there any? No question, okay. I have one, uh, you, you mentioned how it is used in the, in the context of generative models. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure, how much it is used in uh, supervised classification in, in general? Is it widely used? Is it hard to use in that context? And uh, maybe, maybe it can be useful in transfer learning, I guess. 
Yeah, exactly. So there's many. I mean, I'm not really an expert in this. One of the experts is Remy Flammary, for instance, in Ecole Polytechnique, and there's other people. They are trying to use optimal transport in supervised learning. Uh, the simplest case is if your data set is histograms or, or measures, I mean, you can use it. Like if you have multi-class classification, then you can replace uh, classical loss by optimal transport loss. So it's, it's quite nice. For instance, we use it uh, with collaborators in genomics, where the cells are actually like histograms and you want to like do clustering or prediction of cells. So this is a simple application. <coughs> uh, but this is if your data is itself like, like in histograms. And the other application is, as you, as you notice, is, uh, is transfer learning. Uh, where you get a data set in two different spaces. You do prediction in one space and you want to transfer them. And the cool way to do this is to use uh, optimal transport. Of course, it's more complex than this because I guess if you just use vanilla optimal transport, it doesn't work so well. So there's many tricks and extensions that you need to use. Uh, one of these is gromov Wasserstein uh, or Fuse Gromov that they use uh, nowadays in, in machine learning. And, but, and, and there's like many uh, generalizations I would say that could be used. And in, uh, apparently, I mean, I've been told by Remy that they, they, now that it seems to have like very good results. So it seems to reach like a state of the art and even beyond. There is a paper like this here at NeurIPS where they use it for transfer learning on graphs. And they basically uh, beat all the state of the art on graph neural networks with, uh, with this type of method. So, so I'm not an expert, but I, you should really look at the last paper of uh, Remy Flammary, Nicolas Courti, and Laetitia Chapelle, among others, which had a very, very good team. Uh, I'm very impressed, basically, by, by what they do. I think they are like they are becoming leaders in, uh, I mean, leaders at least in the state of the art in uh, deep learning, and they used a lot of uh, of methods from optimal transport. And they, apparently, okay. graph, on graph uh, on problems on graph, it seems to be. Uh, we don't know why. I mean, I mean, basically, just just to be clear, there's no theory, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, but they have like a lot of nice heuristics that on graph seems to indicate it works great. Maybe on other okay, data sets, I don't know, but on, on graph, I can then show you. It's very impressive. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for the reference. I will have a look into it. Okay. And uh, I don't see any more questions. So thank you again, Gabriel, for your presentation. It was really, really nice. Thank you. So I will switch back.